Okay, so before we start, I just wanted to uh, remind you um, that on the 18th, September 18th, it's a Monday, we'll have a test, okay, test number one. It's going to be in person, multiple choices, and uh, there is no makeup, so make sure to come. And you can bring half half of a paper, so that's a paper, so half of a paper, and you can take notes on it, and you can bring it for the test. So test number one. So it will be everything we have covered so far. So the introduction to the class, history, and whatever we're going to cover next week. Is that clear? So the 18. So mark your calendar. So last time, we watched a movie about uh, Einstein and uh, general relativity. So remember that Einstein in 1905, he, he was able to, uh, to come up with the principle that nothing can go faster than speed of light. So it's like a cosmic speed limit. Except when there was the Big Bang, you know, when after the Big Bang, there was an expansion of space. So in that case, yes, it was faster than the speed of light. But except for space, nothing can go faster than the speed of light. So then he said that Newton's view on gravity didn't make sense, okay? It needed some uh, uh, repair. So Newton's view on gravity is that, for example, you have the moon, let's say this is the moon. No, no, let's say this is the moon and this is the earth. According to Newton, the moon is grabbing, uh, the earth is grabbing the moon instantaneously. Okay, so that's the fault due to gravity. Or if, if this is the sun and that's a planet, so the sun is grabbing the planet, so the planet wants to go in a straight line at a constant speed. No, it can't because it's trapped because of gravity. So Einstein said that cannot be because nothing can go faster than the speed of light. So even for gravity to, um, to do its magic, magic, you need higher. So for example, in the movie you watch, if the sun was to disappear all of a sudden, okay, it will take eight minutes for us to leave because it will take eight minutes for gravity to stop acting on the earth. So it took him 10 years from 1905 to 1915. And he came up with this, um, idea that space is curved so you can imagine space in two dimensions three dimension is harder to imagine but if you have a two dimension space you can think of that as a trampoline and if the sun is like a bowling ball so it's gonna it's gonna curve the trampoline right and then the earth here will be trapped in one of these curves so you don't need any more gravity like a force acting at a distance. Of course, this is very complex mathematics. So if you want to send um, a rover, for example, on the moon, like the Indian did, so they are done with their experiment. So it lasted two, two weeks, they, they have collected all the data, and now they are done. But you only need Newton's law, you, you, because it's a nice approximation of Einstein relativity. Now, if you want to explain neutron stars and, and black holes and wormholes, you know, if you want to go from one universe to another universe or one place in the universe to another place in the universe, so you can take a wormhole, then you need Einstein theory of relativity. Okay, so um, to understand that, there is a nice visualization. It's like... Um, if, if you go to the mall, for example, you have what is called wishing web. So if you were a kid, okay, it's like a web here, and then there's a penny, okay, that will go around. If, if there is no friction, if there is no friction, the penny will keep moving forever. Okay, so if there is no friction, and, and they make it as smooth as possible, but it will keep moving as, you know, forever. So same idea. The sun is here, okay, it's curving space-time, 
and the Earth is trapped in that wrapping of space-time. So it worked exactly the same way. And uh, there is a very nice video. I will put the link. Um, we are not going to uh, watch everything, but it's a nice way to visualize space-time. Now, in three dimensions, it's harder to imagine. So why is it I am glued to up, right? So if I try to jump, I'm going to come back. Why is that? It's not because gravity is pulling on me. It's because space, you don't see it because we don't have the right sensors here. Okay, Our sensors are very bad, actually. We only see the visible light part of the electromagnetic spectrum, so very bad sensors. But if we were able to see all around us, it's stuff. You have stuff around us. If I stay on Earth, it's because the space around me is pushing on me, right? It's space itself is, that is pushing on me toward the Earth and not the Earth that is pulling on me. In addition to that, all around you here, you have electromagnetic waves, you know, traveling in all directions. You have all this energy moving and the speed of light, even though you don't see it. So that's why sometimes it's good, it's good to disconnect from your phones and all the electronic because all magnetic field goes through your body. Well, that would be physics. So let's go back to astronomy. So I just wanted to show you. Uh, the, the... I'm, I'm going to make it, I'm going to jump. I'm going to jump around. And uh, it's, it's just a way to show kids to visualize space, right? So you it's like a trampoline here. The explanation for gravity is that matter bends space. And so you put mass in a place in space, it warps space-time, and objects are not feeling a force of gravity, they're just following the natural curvature. And so this is a sheet of lycra. Where do you get this? This is my old bike shorts. Uh, no, there's, there's literally a spandex.com. Uh, you can get a sheet like this if you buy the sale stuff, so you don't care what it looks like, right? Uh, for like 20 bucks, maybe less, depending on the sale. Um, and so you put matter and it warps space-time. And so if I have another object, it also warps space-time. They feel that and they're attracted to each other. And so that's, a, that's Einstein's picture of gravity. Objects warp space-time, feel that curvature, and move accordingly. And if you have more mass, if you have more mass, it's going to bend space-time more, and so if you have objects there, they are going to respond to that, right? And so you put something there, now it's attracted. Now, in reality, that big mass would feel the warping of space-time by the marble, too, right? It would move a little bit, but we usually, we usually ignore that. You know, the Earth makes the Sun move a little bit, but it's so small you can ignore it. The Moon makes the Earth kind of wobble around a point three-quarters of the way from the center of the Earth. We usually don't... Uh, account for that when we're looking at satellite motion. Well, instead of just letting go of one, what if I give it a sideways push? See the wishing now it orbits. Now it's losing energy, which wouldn't See happen uh, in, so in, uh, in the solar it system, right? Not energy, noticeably. Right? There's some perturbations from other planets and things, but this one does and lose energy and spirals in. If I don't push it as hard, like it will do an ellipse. And some more here. So one of the things I thought of to do with this is when you study the solar system, all the planets are going around the sun the same way. Why is that? Did God decide that he only liked clockwise? Or, depends on whether he's above or below the solar system, right? Uh, why, why is everything going in the same direction? Well, the answer is, it wasn't. Different directions. But there was a preferred direction. The disk it formed from had a slight preference one way versus another, and things going the opposite way got eliminated, and when it's all said and done, everything's going the same way. Same way. Yeah, that, usually, that works 90% of the time. <laughs> <laughs> is it like a toilet flushing? Uh, Southern Hemisphere? Wow, can you do that again? Yeah, it's like and so that's kind of cool. Now, my students use a, uh, a PHET FET. Um, simulation so called my solar system. So, the idea, so they've seen all this. Yeah, I will put the link in uh, in in your uh, canvas. So if you're interested, it's super interesting. Now, if uh, if instead of having like just a weight, you have something super 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 heavy, what you're gonna get? A very 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 deep 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 
hole, that's a black hole. And uh, the idea that the black holes have been photographed, so we, we know that they exist. It's not a theory, even they say a theory, no, it's based on experiments, so it's not a theory anymore. Black hole is a real thing. What we we don't know is about warm holes. So if you have a black hole here, it could be that it will connect to another black hole here and it makes a warm hole. So again, when we there was the movie Interstellar, he goes through a black hole. So it's really a shortcut from one place in the universe to another place in the universe, right? So if you go for a warm hole, Connecting two black holes, what's going to happen? Your time will stop. So then when you come back to Earth, you're, maybe your daughter will be older than you. That's the idea of the movie. So very weird stuff. We don't know what's in the black hole. Maybe it's another universe. Maybe it's hell. Maybe it's heaven. Who knows, right? Maybe you have all the ghosts of Newton and Kepler and Tycho Brahe and they have big party and Emily du Châtelet and uh, let's for some women too here. So we don't know, but super interesting. So that came in 1950. So some theory you have to wait for the, the author to die, but it didn't happen with Einstein because in 1919, there was an eclipse, okay? It's called the lunar eclipse, solar eclipse, sorry, a solar eclipse. It happens when, when the moon, you know, it's just in front of the sun. So the moon is between us and the sun. So in that case, you know, you can look at the sun you still need special glasses because it's very rare that it's a total eclipse. But you can look at the sun with, without um, all, all the light uh, blinding you. So there is this uh, eclipse in 1990, and this is the Earth, right? And they knew that there was a star here. That star was not to be located here. So the, the earth goes around the sun, I see the star, okay, I go behind the sun, I don't see the star. So if, if space is not wrapped, then you will not be able to see the, sky, the star, okay, because it's behind the sun. But because space is curved like a trampoline net, then the light from the sun, you know, goes into the, the curve here, Right? So it's going to go like this, it's going to be curving, and then the apparent position of the sun is going to be here, and that's what they saw. So for example, here again, that was in 2017, here you have a white dwarf. So a white dwarf is a dead body, it's a remnant, okay? Our sun will become a white dwarf, it's the leftover of from a medium size sun. And there was a real star here, real star position here, but because that white dwarf has so much mass, it's curving space like a trampoline net. And you're gonna see it here. So it's like a mirage, that's how mirage works, right? And that was the proof of Einstein general relativity. So from day to night or night to day, not sure, uh, he became like a rock star, okay? He was super, super famous. And uh, he did, surprisingly, few people know that, but he didn't get the Nobel Prize because of special relativity and general relativity. He got the Nobel Prize for something else, for the photoelectric effect. He, he was able to show that if you have the sun, for example, and you use, uh, for example, a solar solar panel, the sun, the light from the sun is made of photons, like little particles, and those little particles can kick out electrons from semiconductor, from solar panel, and then you can produce electricity. So this is called the photoelectric effect. That's why he got the Nobel Prize. Even though special and general relativity was a genius, uh, theory, of course, right? It was a big, big breakthrough. It was the beginning of modern physics. Okay, so uh, so remember, if you are 
on on Earth, and if you jump, you're gonna come back. You're not coming back because the Earth is pulling on you, but because space time around you is pushing down on you. It's very weird, and I will uh, share with you uh, the video. So about let's see if I have picture here eclipse. So you see here, I have another picture. So you see the sun, this is the earth, and that's where the star is. But because light, when it's traveling, it tried to go in a straight line, but now it's going into that curve here. From your point of view, you're gonna see the star here. So it's like what we call a virtual image. It's a mirage. Something happened, for example, if it's very hot on the highway, looks like you have paddled, you know, on the highway, like water. Okay, it's not water. It looks like water, but it's not. It's just like a mirage, right, from, from the sun, from, from the sky. Okay, because light is curved, and then you see that mirage. So it's like a mirage. It's an apparent uh, image, but that was the proof of general relativity. And then, of course, we have other proof as well, like gravitational waves that we talk about. So if you have two neutron stars, so it's like a very heavy bowling ball on the trampoline net. If the bowling ball, you know, they, they start to move around each other, you're gonna make wave on the trampoline net. So that's gravitational waves. And recently they discovered that, they were able to detect that, and that also led to a Nobel Prize. And of course, it can be only explained by general relativity. So that experiment was done in 1990. Um, the expedition was led by Sir Arthur Eddington, I will talk about him in a moment. And he, he's one, one of the physicists who really believed in Newton. Uh, no, in Einstein, sorry. Because you remember, Einstein was not very unknown at the time. He was just a clerk in a patent office, right? So he was doing paperwork all the time. And Eddington really believed in Einstein and pushed him under the spotlight. So because he was very famous in England, you see it's a sir, sir meaning he was knighted. He was a nobleman. And uh, he organized that expedition in an island west of Africa. It's called Principi Island. So you can you can go here and learn about it. So Eddington, you see him here sitting with Einstein. Later on, so he he was a good guy here, but later on he became the advisor of Chandra Sekhar. Remember, I talked about Chandra Sekhar. I don't know if you remember. Do you remember Chandra Sekhar? He, he was from India. He was uh, very young. So it was at the time of uh, British India. So he came uh, from India with, uh, in a boat because at the time, you know, you are not flying. So And, and the, the, the journey lasts for months. And Eddington was his advisor. During that journey, okay, he used quantum physics and he used general relativity to predict that a star, a dying star, cannot have a mass larger than 1.44, uh, the mass of the sun. It's called the Chandra Seca limit. So for example, at the end of its life, our sun will become a white dwarf. If the white dwarf has a mass larger than 1.44, the mass of the sun, it's gonna collapse, explode in a supernova, and the left over will be a neutron star. So he did that on his journey to England to be educated. Unfortunately, his advisor, Lord Eddington, was uh, uh, shame, shame him publicly, okay, it was not very nice, he made fun of him, but at the end, he still got the uh, Nobel Prize 1993, and he has a very famous um, telescope, space telescope named after him, which is called the Chandra um, X-ray telescope. 
So an amazing life, okay? He was only 19 years old when he figured this out. Also a genius. So sometimes when people are young, you know, they are more open to new ideas and maybe when they get older, you know, it's not, not so much open. I don't know how to interpret that. Any questions so far? So then we come to Edwin Hubble, 1920s, and he's the one, among others, that came up with the idea that after the Big Bang, the universe uh, started to expand. So here it's, it's, a, it's again, like, uh, just to understand what's going on, it's like a 2D universe, right? But you see, you can imagine a 2D universe and, and here it starts to expand. So it's the expansion of the universe. So first of all, um, he looked, he used a telescope in California at Mount Wilson, Pasadena, California. And then he observed those nebulae in, in the sky Remember that William Herschel, with his uh, sister Caroline, he was the one who cataloged those nebulae. Nebulae means just cloud, fuzzy stuff. And he's the one who said those fuzzy stuff are actually all the galaxies. Okay, they are several galaxies. So he said those nebulae are galaxies. And he discovered, among others, and I will tell you how he did that that all those galaxies, you know, around us, part of other groups of galaxies, are all moving away from each other. So in our local group, remember, Andromeda is coming towards us, okay? But if you look beyond that group, all the galaxies are moving away from each other. How come? It's not that they are really moving, but remember the trampoline net, or, or uh, like a Pilati band, exercise band, it's, it's the fabric, fabric between the group of galaxies that is expanding. And it cannot break. It can expand and expand and expand and expand. Okay? So how he did that, I will explain that. Uh, he did that by looking at the red shift. So let me, let me explain what's a red shift. So a little bit of physics, not much. There is no math. So that's a good idea. So let me ask you something. When, uh, when there is an ambulance coming towards you, or someone, you know, pushing the hunk, what does it go like? Does it go, yeah, or does it go, huh? or does it go, huh? the first, the second, or the third? The first, right? That's what you say? No? Who says first or the second? Does it go here? Oh, or does it go the first? Very good, right? Yeah. So when it goes here, that means the frequency increases. Higher frequency. When it's moving away, lower frequency. So it means when it's coming towards you, that means smaller wavelength, higher frequency, away from you, lower frequency, larger wavelength. So you can see that in that uh, drawing here, if it's at rest, you're gonna hear the high, the, the, the height pitch. Okay, the pitch is the right one. If it's moving towards you, you see all those wave front are piling up, so that means the frequency is going to increase and the size of the wave will get smaller, so smaller wavelength. So it goes, and then it's moved away from you in that direction, it's going, oh. so the pitch will be lower. So it's moving away from you, lower pitch, toward you, higher pitch. And of course, if it's moving really fast, all those wave front will pile up and you have you break the uh, the sound speed. Okay, it's like a, a shocking wave, a shock wave. You make a shock wave, but that really uh, can destroy your uh, ear, your um, 
draw. Okay, so higher pitch, lower pitch, small wave length, that will be the size, the size of the wave, okay, large wave length. So there, there was a very funny video that explained that. Um, here, let's see. So it's one of the most famous... I want to talk to you about before we go to the party. I don't care if anybody gets it. I'm going as the Doppler effect. <laughs> no, it's not... If bad. I have to, I can demonstrate. <laughs> so what time does the costume parade start? The parade? Yeah, so the judges can give out the prizes for best costume. You know, most frightening. Accurate visualization of a scientific principle. Sheldon, I'm sorry, but there aren't going to be any parades or judges or prizes. This party is just going to suck. Oh, come on, it's going to be fun, and you all look great. I mean, look at you, Thor, and, and oh, Peter Pan, that's so cute. Actually, Penny, he's wrong. Not Peter Pan! <laughs> and I got a handful of pixie dust with your name on it. No, you don't. Uh, hey, what's Sheldon supposed to be? Oh, he's the Doppler effect. Yes. It's the apparent change in the frequency of a wave caused by relative motion between the source of the wave and the observer. Oh, sure, I see it. Now the Doppler effect. All right, I got a shower. You guys, um, make yourselves comfortable. So we put the link. Um, he, he said it right. This actor understands nothing in, to physics or science, right? But he has such a very good memorization. He's a very good actor. So yes, so it's the apparent shift in frequency due to the relative motion between the source and the observer. That's called the Doppler effect. Yeah, right? So when you are getting a ticket, you see all those police officers, they have some kind of a gun that make a microwave. The microwave, it's gonna move. And let's say it's moving, the car is moving toward the police officer. So the microwave is gonna bounce back Okay, so there is a shift in frequency because the car is moving really fast. So then there is a code that will compute your speed. That's how it works, right? So the, the, the police officer, they can find your speed using the Doppler effect because there is a change in frequency due to the relative motion between the source, the officer, and the... And, um, the observer, where it goes and then it's bouncing back. So what's interesting about that, you say, okay, what's, there is no sound in space. Okay, I agree with you. For sound to move, you need a medium. You need something to shake. However, there is also a Doppler effect for light. So let me just show you here. This is the electromagnetic spectrum. You see that we only see the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So here you have red and here you have blue. All, all the way here are the dangerous stuff that you don't want to exp be exposed to UV, X-ray, gamma ray. On the other side, this is all safe infrared. This is just a heat wave. Okay, so for example, you are alive because you are burning fuel, you have a metabolism, so you are emitting infrared, that's why you are glowing in the dark, okay, so the military, you know, they have those special night vision for the firefighter, so you, they can see people glowing in the dark, okay, so it's called night vision, and then you have microwave right away, so which one have the largest size of the wave? Okay, or the largest wavelength. So wavelength is between crest to crest. Is it radio wave or gamma ray? Radio wave, right? Large wavelength. And here, very small wavelength. So it means they also have high frequency. So small wavelength, high frequency. So they are very dangerous because of course they are so small, it will go through you. Okay, it will not be even be stopped by your bones, right? So too much exposition to gamma rays can kill you. You don't even have time to develop cancer. You just die from radiation sickness. High energy, that means it goes through you. It's going to destroy your cells because it's going to burping out all that energy. Radio wave, just uh, 
it, it would do stuff, but not, not as bad as that. So very large wavelength and low frequency. Okay, so which one has the lower wavelength? The red or the blue? Red, very good, lower wavelength and lower frequency. So that's why, for example, they say uh, some, sometimes, I don't know in Florida, but in some states you cannot have a blue laser because blue, blue that means higher frequency, higher energy. If, if you have that in your eyes, you can destroy it. So red, lower energy, lower frequency, larger wavelength. Okay, where, where I'm coming to, I'm coming to the Doppler effect for light. So for example, that would be in the lab, okay, if a star or a source of light, it's not moving, like an incandescent light or the sun, if the sun is not moving, that's what you're gonna see. And if it's moving away from you, okay, it's gonna go into the blue, okay? It will be bluer, right? So all those lines here will be, no, what did I say? Moving away from you, it will be what, red or blue? Moving away, you increase the wavelength, so you go to the red. Excellent. You should all take physics, right? You good. So red, it will move to the red. So you see that line is moving to the red. If something is moving toward you, it's going to the blue. It will be bluer. Okay? So what he find out, uh, Edwin Hubble, is that when he looked at those galaxies, they were all going into the red, okay? They were red shifted. That means that the universe was expanding and this is called the red shift. So I have a short video, red shift. I think it's a short video. Stars are made up of a number of different elements. The Sun is composed of about 73% hydrogen, 25% helium, 0.8% oxygen, and 0.36% carbon, plus smaller amounts of other elements. Each of these elements absorbs certain wavelengths of light. White light is made up of the full spectrum of wavelengths. But the presence of elements such as hydrogen and helium results in black lines in the spectrum. These are the spectral lines for hydrogen, and the black lines appear at the particular wavelengths that are absorbed by hydrogen. Here are the spectral lines for the sun. By analysing these lines, scientists can tell what elements make up the sun. And spectral lines can also be used to investigate what elements make up stars and distant galaxies. Scientists can also use spectral lines to work out whether a galaxy, like this, is moving towards the Earth or away from the Earth. Let's compare two sets of spectral lines for this galaxy as we expect them to appear. The positions of the spectral lines are based on the absorption lines for various elements as they have been measured in laboratories on Earth. If the galaxy was moving towards an observer on the Earth, the spectral lines would shift to the blue end of the spectrum. This is known as a blue shift. If the galaxy was moving away from an observer on the Earth, the spectral lines would shift to the red end of the spectrum. This is known as a red shift. The further the spectral lines are shifted, the faster the galaxy is moving away from the observer and the further away the galaxy is from the Earth. Astronomers such as Edwin Hubble measured the spectral lines of hundreds of galaxies in the visible universe and found that most galaxies display a red shift. This led to the conclusion that the galaxies were moving away from the Earth and that the universe must be expanding. Okay, so I just have a movie about Edwin Hubble because such a, it was such a breakthrough. But I'm, I'm going to make it go fast, so then we can move. For those who are late, I will take attendance at the end. And we have a test the 18th of September, and you can bring a half half of a paper, okay? Uh, multiple choices. So it's and try not to sleep. I see people sleeping. It's a small class. I can see. 
<laughs> when you are sleeping. No, no, because you you make your study guide. The study guide will be the slides. So everything we have covered. I will tell you. I will tell you what to have you. So you can go over the slides and take notes. It will be very similar to the homework. Similar questions, multiple choices. Do we have a homework for this week or I forgot to assign? Do we have a homework? Okay. Question. Is uh, the test on the same software like uh, Canvas? No, no, it will be in person on paper. So uh, I will uh, uh, give you a paper and then you mark the multiple choices. So it's not on Canvas. And uh, in person, about 20 questions, multiple choices. Make sure not to miss the test. Okay, there is no makeup. The 18th September, I think it's a Monday. And you can bring half, half a paper and you can take notes and bring it. If you pay attention in class and you know it's not much studying except doing your homework, and if you don't sleep, fall asleep. Ever since people started thinking about the structure of the universe, they have sought to plumb its depths. But it took an American astronomer to solve the puzzle concerning its limits, if any. Is it, um, can, can you, can you understand it's not too fast? It's Edwin Powell Hubble came at the end of a long line of scientists, some of whom paid with their lives for their curiosity. In 1600, the Holy Inquisition sentenced Gordano Bruno to death, among other things, because he had declared the universe to be without limit and home to an infinite number of worlds. 87 years later, Isaac Newton provided theoretical support for the worldview of Nicholas Copernicus, according to whom the sun, and not the earth, was at the center of all things. In evidence, Newton pointed to the attractive force of the sun, which keeps the planets in their orbits. In so doing, he shook the view taken by the church to its foundations. But in other ways, he provided the church with intellectual support. Newton had observed that many of the so-called fixed stars did in fact move. According to his laws of motion, however, everything would have to be in motion, including heavenly bodies still unseen. Consequently, the universe could not have any limits. This explanation by Newton now seemed to go down well in Rome. After all, it accorded with the idea that God had created the universe in his own image. If God was eternal, then so must the universe be. But how did the universe come about in the first place? And why are the stars so far apart, when gravity should be pulling them together? Newton did not have the instruments to answer these questions, but in the next 250 years, great progress was made. Using a huge telescope he had built himself, William Herschel discovered the planet Uranus in 1785. While observing the heavens, Herschel also kept coming across bright points surrounded by a sort of fuzz. At first he thought they were stars surrounded by clouds of gas and dust. In 1845, the Irish astronomer William Parsons, the Earl of Ross, completed his reflecting telescope, which he called Leviathan. Weighing 10 tons, it was the most powerful telescope of its day. With it, Ross recognized for the first time that many of these nebulae, as they were called, were spiral in form. He did not know that they were other galaxies. This drawing is amazingly detailed, as can be seen by comparing it with a photograph. But while more and more spiral nebulae were discovered, there was still no model to explain what they actually were. This man was to provide the answer. Edwin Powell Hubble was born in Marshfield, Missouri, on the 20th of November 1889, the son of an insurance salesman. At an early stage, he developed a keen interest in astronomy, and Jules Verne's From the Earth to the Moon was one of his favorite stories. His grandfather had built a telescope for himself, and young Edwin spent many a night using it to observe the heavens. His father's business brought the family to Wheaton, a suburb of Chicago. Edwin was allowed to spend the night of the 23rd of June, 1899, with his friend Sam in the open air to watch an eclipse of the moon. A magnificent spectacle for the two boys. Because of his good grades at school, Edwin won a scholarship to the University of Chicago, where he studied mathematics and astronomy, besides excelling in college sport.
but although his passion was astronomy, he followed his father's wishes, and in 1910 went to England to study law at Oxford. He was neither particularly interested nor particularly successful. Three years later, he returned and continued his astronomy studies at the Yerkes Observatory in Chicago in 1914. In his doctoral dissertation, Hubble hypothesized that the spiral nebulae were independent galaxies, far beyond our own Milky Way. But in order to prove this, he had somehow to measure their distance. For this purpose, astronomers used a class of stars whose brightness varies periodically, known as CIFID variables. They have proved a useful astronomical measuring rod. To track down some of these CIFID variables, Hubble went in 1919 to the Hale Observatory on Mount Wilson near Pasadena, where the world's largest telescope had been brought into operation the year before. A reflector, its mirror was 100 inches or 254 centimeters in diameter. Hubble devoted his attention at first to the Andromeda Nebula, the only galaxy visible with the naked eye from the Northern Hemisphere. He hoped to find CIFID variables there. And indeed, after years of intensive observation, he found some in the middle of the Andromeda galaxy. He captured the result on photographic plates. With the aid of the Cifids, he now succeeded in determining the distance of the Andromeda Nebula from the Earth, a good 800,000 light years. This enormous distance is about eight times the diameter of the Milky Way, so the Andromeda Nebula cannot possibly be part of our home galaxy. Although we now know that the Andromeda Nebula is in fact three times more distant still, 2.4 million light years, Hubble had already proved that there were galaxies beyond our own Milky Way. Once it was clear that there must be independent galaxies, Hubble and his assistant Milton Humerson set about analyzing their spectra. The lines in a spectrum are what make it unique. They provide astrophysicists with a kind of optical fingerprint, which supplies various pieces of information. Among them, the chemical composition of the source, in this case, the galaxies. The two astronomers noticed that the lines were shifted towards the red end of the spectrum, a sign that the galaxies were moving away from the Earth. This red shift derives from the fact that the light is a wave. Visible light ranges from red, with a wavelength of about 700 nanometers, to violet with a wavelength of 390 nanometers. Waves at the red end are longer. When a cosmic object, a galaxy for example, is receding from the Earth, the waves are stretched. In other words, its spectrum is shifted towards the red end. An approaching body would display a corresponding blue shift. Its waves would be squashed. This phenomenon, known as the Doppler effect, is also observable with sound. It is named after the Austrian physicist Christian Doppler, who noticed that a locomotive steam whistle sounds higher when it is approaching and lower when it's receding. The pitch changes because the sound waves and the sound source are moving. If the source is approaching, the waves are squashed and the shorter waves sound higher. If the train is moving away from us, the waves are stretched and longer waves sound lower. If this logic is applied to the galaxies, a redshift, in other words a lengthening of the light waves, means that the galaxy must be receding. Most of the galaxies investigated by Hubble were in fact redshifted, and the more distant they were, the more pronounced the redshift. This means that the most distant galaxies are receding the fastest. This association between distance and velocity has gone down in history as the Hubble effect. It proves that the universe is expanding and that the galaxies are drifting apart, like points on a rubber band when it is stretched. Hubble was even able to back up his discovery with a mathematical formula known as Hubble's law. It states that the velocity of recession, in other words the speed at which the galaxies are moving apart, increases in proportion to the distance between them. Hubble's discovery supports the theory of the Big Bang, the idea that the universe did actually have an origin, a theory in accordance with the creation image of the Christian Church. The Vatican Observatory at Castel Gandolfo was the workplace of the Belgian Jesuit priest Georges Lemaitre, a respected astronomer and an ardent advocate of the Big Bang Theory, long before it was given this name. According to Lemaitre, the universe emerged from a primordial atom created by God. He was happy with the idea that the universe was expanding. The astronomer priest sought support for his thesis from one of the most respected scientists of his day, Albert Einstein. 
However, Einstein favoured the steady-state model, a universe with no beginning. When Einstein visited Hubble on Mount Wilson in January 1931, Lemaitre was also present. After they had presented their views to Einstein, he admitted that he had been wrong. But there were other scientists who opposed the Big Bang Theory. Foremost among them, the British astronomer Sir Fred Hoyle. Hoyle demanded proof of the Big Bang and wanted at least to see its leftovers. Let's see the fossil record of this Big Bang, he joked. In 1948, the American physicists George Gamow, Hans Bethe and Ralph Uffer published an article in which they described what this fossil would have to look like. Residual heat in space, a kind of background radiation. They assumed that the Big Bang would have generated an enormous amount of heat. True, the universe had had more than 13 billion years to cool down, but even so, a minimal background radiation was to be expected, just above the absolute zero of minus 273 degrees Celsius. In the mid-1960s, the bell... That's what we're going to see next time. I just want to, let's see, uh, do I have time? Yeah. yeah. To explain something that might not be clear... So well, I made uh, this universe here, except it's a one one dimension universe. And what you see here are just groups of galaxies, okay? Cluster of galaxies. So imagine you live uh, here, you live here. That's you inside here. Are you with me? So it's inside here. If the universe is expanding, okay? Let's say it's expanding at a constant rate. So it doesn't accelerate because at the time it didn't know about the acceleration. So let's say it's expanding at a constant rate from your point of view because it's, a, it's like rubber band. During the same time, this one will move faster than that one. Okay, because you are making more rubber. Uh, between there, because because it's like a penalty band, right? So you are making more space. So even though it's expanding at a constant rate, from your point of view, you have more distance during the same time being made between here and there, relative to here and there. Okay, so it means relative to you in this cluster of galaxies, farther away you look, faster it moves away from you. But it does not mean that the universe is accelerating at the time. It just means that it's expanding and that space between the cluster of galaxies is like some kind of rubber, right? That you can stretch as much as you want, okay? So that was the discover, discovery of Edwin Hubble. From our point of view, all the galaxies far away are moving away from us at a constant rate, meaning the space is expanding at a constant rate, so they thought. And then uh, that was against Einstein, because Einstein said, no, it should be moving at a constant speed, space, or not moving.